Scripture with you this morning. Would you please open your Bible back up to the New Testament letter to the Hebrews today. If you're just joining us, we've been walking through Hebrews for the last 10 weeks now. And we're going to pick back up where we left off last Sunday in chapter 6. You can open your Bible there. You can use that pew Bible in front of you if you want to. You can follow along on the screen. And just as a reminder, if you don't have a copy of God's Word in a translation that you can read and understand, you're not only invited, but you're encouraged. Please take that pew Bible home with you today as a Thanksgiving present or something like that. Take it home so you can have a copy of God's Word in a translation you can read and understand and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, apply it to your life. So we'll be in Hebrews chapter 6 this morning. On April 10th, 1912, the RMS Titanic set sail from Northampton, England, on its way to New York City on her maiden voyage. Now, ice in the North Atlantic is a seasonal hazard, very dangerous for ships in that time of year, And not long after she left port, Titanic began to immediately receive messages about how much ice had built up on the path that she was supposed to travel on. On April the 11th, she received six warnings from ships that were either stuck in or had passed through severe ice. The next day, five more warnings on the 12th. Three more warnings on the 13th, and seven warnings on April the 14th. All these warnings would have been written down on the radio log and passed on to the bridge for the captain and other officers on deck to see. And even though he received these warnings clearly, the captain decided that his ship was secure, that the strength of his vessel and their ability to maneuver around any ice they see made these warnings not really apply to them because their ship was superior. They received their last warning on April the 14th at 9.40 in the evening. They struck ice at 11.20 and sank to the bottom of the North Atlantic by 2.20 the next day, taking 100 or 1,500 lives along with them. The worst kind of security is false security that leads us to ignore the very real warnings around us. And over these last 10 weeks, we've been walking through the letter to the Hebrews, and along the way, we've heard some pretty sharp and clear warnings from our author. You might remember back in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he said, Therefore, brothers, we must pay much closer attention to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And then in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, the author said, Take care, brothers, lest there be among you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. This morning as we get to Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, the author offers what might be his strongest warning yet in the letter written to these early Jewish Christians who had professed faith in Christ, but are now feeling tempted to to fall away and to go back, to revert to their old ways and their old life under the old covenant in Judaism, minus Jesus. Let's pick up today in Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. 
But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed. And its end is to be burned. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. Let's go to the Lord together and pray. Our Father in heaven, as we've walked through this letter inspired by your Spirit, there's been many passages that have caused us to stop and to consider, to to hear clearly your Spirit-filled warnings in your word, and yet I dare say there hasn't been one like this that we've encountered yet. One that If we were sleepwalking through this letter, this would be the bucket of ice water down our backs. To stop and to take note. Father, we need your spirit to help us to hear today. All of us. We need your spirit to give us eyes to see. We need your spirit to give us ears that are ready to listen, but not simply to comprehend a message with our mind, but Father, to give us hearts that are softened. Not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, but ready to take in the message of your word like rich and fertile soil and to bear fruit. Father, would you do that good work in us as we walk through this passage today? In Jesus' name, amen. So in our passage this morning, the author begins to describe a certain group of people that may have been a part of this early community of believers or those who he sees could possibly be a part of it in the future. He describes people who have experienced fully the goodness and the power and the truth of life among the faithful in the body of believers, living life in in the church. He talks about people who have been enlightened and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God. In other words, they have heard the message of the gospel, the good news of the one true God and what He has done and will ultimately do through His Son, Jesus. They have sat under sound doctrine week in and week out, and maybe even demonstrated that they understand the message. They have intellectual comprehension on the truth about God. He goes on to say these are people who have tasted the heavenly gift, which many commentators believe he's talking about the the blessings and the benefits of of life together in that heavenly family called the church, united together in Christ. A, A blessing that we see symbolized in that Lord's Supper table that we take together, but it's described beautifully in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. When the author says they have tasted the heavenly gift, they have been a part of that kind of, of life-giving community and the joy that can come from that. And as you heard described in that passage, the author of Hebrews says, these are people who in some way, shape, or form have shared in the Holy Spirit. He says that they've, they've tasted the powers of the age to come. They have seen, experienced, heard, maybe even benefited from the powerful working of the Holy Spirit among them, in signs and wonders and miracles. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, the author said that God bore witness to these people, to the people he's writing with, with signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. And so the, the author is talking about people who have seen and experienced and heard the truth about Christ, the goodness of Christ, and the power of Christ by His Spirit. And yet he's talking about people, he says, that in spite of all they've seen and heard and benefited from, that there would be some 
who we said had fallen away. And he says it is impossible in the case of those who have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. So what does it mean to fall away? Is the author saying that anyone who's experienced the power and truth and goodness of God and then falls into any sin whatsoever, whether it's, you know, sexual immorality or debauchery or greed or gossip or drunkenness or whatever, that if you, if you fall into any kind of sin after experiencing those things that you cannot repent, you're beyond saving, there is no hope. Well, if that was the case, all of us are sunk in this room, including me. But more than that, it flies directly in the face of what the Apostle John writes to early believers in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Writing to Christians, the Apostle says, If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In Luke chapter 11, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught his followers to pray Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Which leads us to believe that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, forgive us of our sins, that we were going to need that prayer. Not just once or twice, but throughout our entire lives. So, So this falling away that he's talking about, from which there is no repentance, no restoration, it can't be just someone falling into any sin whatsoever. So what is he talking about? What is this falling away that he says the guilty would be crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now, the word contempt is a powerful word. It actually carries a couple meanings with it. To hold someone up to contempt is to declare them to be worthless, without value, despicable, deserving of scorn, It's also a way of saying they are guilty as charged and worthy of whatever punishment they have coming. And so what kind of sin would hold the Son of God to contempt, to call Him despicable and worthless and guilty and worthy of scorn and shame? Well, again, for those who had, in this first century world, experienced the power of Christ, heard the truth about Christ, even taken part in and benefited in the goodness of Christ, it would be those who experienced and were surrounded by all of those things and then turned and utterly and completely rejected Christ forever. Turned away from Him and went back, in this case, to their old life in Judaism. Their former life under the old covenant minus Jesus. After all they had seen and experienced the power and truth and goodness of Christ to say, you know what? He isn't the Messiah, and therefore he died for his own sins, not for mine. He is guilty as charged, and he's nothing but a fraud, a fake, a liar, a would-be Messiah figure that went off course and therefore was worthy of everything he got on that Good Friday. To hold him up to scorn and public disgrace by returning and rejecting him completely and forever. Now, there's a term for that in theology. It's the term apostasy, which means to abandon, to defect, or to turn back from the faith. And that image of turning back is one that the author has already utilized in this letter. If you remember back in Hebrews chapter 3, he was talking about that wilderness generation that God rescued from bondage and captivity 
from Egypt. And those were the very same people that that saw the Passover and saw the plagues on Pharaoh and were led through the dry ground of the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years. And they saw the manna from heaven, the quail from the winds, and the fire at Sinai, and the law. And they saw God preserve them and carry them for 40 years and lead them all the way up to the cusp of the promised land. And then they turned back. They rejected the Lord, they turned away from the God who had saved them and loved them and provided for them and said, you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. We can't trust you with our lives. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to our old life. And it's hard not to imagine that the author of Hebrews still has that wilderness generation in mind when he writes our passage today. Because those people of Israel had experienced the power of God's Spirit. They had tasted the manna from heaven, even fruit from the promised land. They received the word of God from Sinai. They saw the power and goodness of God and signs and wonders from from the Exodus all the way through the wilderness. And they professed to believe it. They professed to follow God. They, They promised to keep the covenant. And yet when they came to the edge of the Jordan, they turned back. They defected. They abandoned their faith. In the Lord, even after all they'd seen. And because of that, they were not able to enter into that promised land. They would not cross over the Jordan, but would die in the wilderness. And it was because of that generation and that example the author wrote back in chapter 3. Take care, brothers, lest there be among you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to what? Fall away from the living God. Just like that wilderness generation had seen and heard and experienced so much of God's power and goodness and truth and yet turned away and rejected the Lord and were not able to enter the promised land. So those who had seen and heard and experienced so much of the goodness and power and truth of Christ, and yet then turned and utterly and completely rejected Jesus. The author said, cannot be restored to repentance. They are crucifying again the Son of God to hold to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. I want to make one thing very clear so there's no misunderstanding here. What the author is describing here is not someone who has been exposed to the truth of Christ, the goodness of God, maybe grew up in the church, and then decided, you know what, that's not for me. I'm just going to turn away from that and walk away. And then later on in their life, maybe they, they come to see the truth and the beauty of Christ and the power of God, and they then earnestly want to follow Him, desperately and sincerely want to repent of their sins and come to Christ, and then are told, well, no, you can't. You, you lost your chance. Your window of opportunity was there. You saw the truth and then you rejected it. So now there is no place for repentance for you. Even though you earnestly, desperately, sincerely desire to follow Jesus. No, that's not the case because of what Jesus himself said three times in John chapter 6. Three incredible truths. One, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, that desire to know and to follow Christ and to to repent and, and know the Lord comes from the Father doing that work in someone's heart. Number two, Jesus said, all those whom the Father gives to me will come to me. And number three, in John 6, 37, Jesus said, those who come to me, I will never whatsoever turn away. I will never whatsoever cast out. It's a double negative in the Greek. I will never, ever turn away those who genuinely come to me. And that needs to be clear. There is never a point when someone comes to Christ with a heart of faith, wanting to follow him, wanting to repent, wanting to know him, and Jesus says, no. No. He says, all those who come to me, I will never cast away. What's being described here in our passage this morning is what the author had said earlier in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. 
that a heart can become so hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, they never desire to repent. They never desire to come to the Lord. They never sincerely desire to know and follow Jesus. And so it's not this issue of someone who's desperately wanting to follow Christ. He says, no, you had your chance. No, these are people who have ardently and forever turned away and will never desire to repent. And so it cannot be restored. This is actually what you see the author describing when he compares that worldliness generation, the permanence of their rejection and the hardness of their heart. Now, the question that naturally arises out of this passage for many of us, that picture of those who had fallen away, those who had seen and experienced the power, the goodness, the truth of Christ, and yet eventually turn away and reject the Lord, are those people who, who God had sincerely saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and yet from their own rebellion and their own stubborn rejection of the Lord had lost their salvation, had undone the work that God had, had accomplished in their hearts? Or are these people who, in spite of all the exposure and being surrounded by the things of God, and maybe even showing early indications of faith, were never truly saved. Never truly had that genuine, sincere, saving faith from the Lord. Or another way of asking the question is, okay, if we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, in spite of our sin and apart from our works, can we undo the saving work of God because of our sin and in light of our works? How secure is our salvation? How effective and permanent is what God does when he saves someone. How secure are we in the Lord? This is what scripture says in John chapter 10 verse 27 through 29. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. In the next chapter of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25, we're going to read that Christ is able to save to the uttermost. And I'm going to, I love it when we get to that passage, that word uttermost means completely, in totality, from beginning to end, all-encompassing, save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul writes, I am sure of this, that He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. God who begins that work in us promises to be the one to carry it on to completion. And because of that, Paul writes in Romans 8, 29-30, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And the incredible part about that passage is when he talks about our being glorified, that's what happens when we're resurrected and remade with Christ and new heavens and new earth, and yet it's so sure that Paul writes of it in the past tense as if it's already happened. That we have been glorified because it's that sure. He goes on to write in verses 38 and 39, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, things that have happened in the past and things you don't know about yet, things in the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, I love this phrase, nor anything else in all creation. Just in case Paul missed something, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And these are just five of the several passages that we could go to in Scripture that talk about the 
absolute security and effectiveness of our salvation that God has accomplished by His grace in the heart of all those who believe and trust and follow Jesus. No one and nothing can snatch us out of the hand of the Father and the Son and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The living God who begins that work in us, He promises to carry it on to completion. So much so that when Paul writes about us being glorified, he writes about it in the past tense, as if it's already happened. That nothing in all of creation, and that includes ourselves, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, when we hear our passage this morning, we can, we can conclude that the folks that he's talking about in this, in this passage, those who have been around the things of God, the power, the truth, the goodness of God, and yet have ultimately turned away and rejected Christ, they didn't lose their salvation, folks. They never truly had it in the first place. They never truly knew the Lord, that saving faith they never possessed. It's like a picture of folks that maybe lived in the house for a while and sat down at the table and they ate the meal and they enjoyed the couch and they were taking in all this hospitality, but they were not really a part of the family. They weren't truly sons and daughters. And how do we know that? Because they ultimately rejected Christ and turned away from the Lord. This is the way John writes about it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. He says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain, that it might be evident that they're all not of us. This is precisely the point that the author of Hebrews made about that wilderness generation, Hebrews 4, verse 2. For the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were united by faith with those who listened. They heard the same message. The whole congregation got the truth of God, but that message didn't benefit them because they didn't truly believe. And their turning away from God demonstrated they didn't possess that genuine faith. Hebrews 3.14 says, For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. That again, our perseverance is not what saves us. The strength of our grip is what our salvation lies. But no, our perseverance by God's grace is the evidence, is the sign, is the indication that we possess that genuine faith, that we are held within His hand. And nothing and no one can snatch us away. To drive home the point of this passage, the author goes on in verse 7 and 8 to kind of give us an agricultural picture. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. The point is the same rain is falling on two different types of fields. It's not a picture of, uh, of two fields that both have grown vegetation, both are flourishing and bearing fruit and having a harvest, but one lost it along the way. No, the result of those two fields shows the true nature of what's going on in the soil itself. One bears fruit, one has a harvest, and one thorns and thistles. It's very similar to the passage we heard earlier from Jesus in Matthew chapter 13 the different types of soils that take in the seed of the message of the kingdom of God. And when you think about the audience of Hebrews, you can't help but connect it to that second soil, that rocky soil. The seed came, and because it was shallow, it sprung up quickly, and man, it looked good for a moment. But then when the sun came out, it scorched the plant, and it withered away. Jesus said, these are those who hear the word of God and immediately receive it with joy. There's excitement, and yet There's no root, and it endures for a while. But when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. There's that phrase again. The same phrase that the author of Hebrews uses in our passage. Those who have fallen away prove to be that 
that field of shallow soil, that field of thorns and thistles where the seed of faith never takes deep root to grow. On contrary, those who are in Christ, those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, over the course of their life, there is going to be change. There's going to be growth. There's going to be transformation. Not overnight, not all at once. Jesus actually says that they bear fruit with patience. It takes a long time over the course of our lives, but there is that change. There's that fruit of the Spirit. Martin Luther famously said that we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. It's accompanied by a life that looks, by God's grace, more and more like Jesus. As we said last week, growth is the expectation. It's not the exception for the follower of Christ. And most of all, there's perseverance. There's holding on to Christ through hardship and suffering. Hey, it doesn't mean that genuine followers of Jesus won't have seasons of doubt and depression, seasons where it looks like they are completely off the rails. Honestly, I've had them. And yet by God's grace, they will be held by the Lord and will never ultimately reject Christ forever. There will be a repentance and a restoration to prove that they truly are in the Lord. And so for the Titanic, the icebergs in the water were the big, tra- the big danger, and they neglected them, ignored them to their own peril. For us, it's the deceptive nature of our own heart that can prove to be the most dangerous for us. Because we begin to buy into the lie that shallow, superficial association with the things of God is the same as genuine faith, we're sailing in very dangerous waters. The author of Hebrews makes it clear in our passage that you can be surrounded by the things of Christ, the words of Christ, the experiences of Christ's Spirit. You can even be engaged in the people of Christ and have warm, sentimental feelings about Christ and yet not truly know Christ. You can come to church. We can sing the songs. You can hear and even understand intellectually the message. We can pack shoeboxes. We can give to missions. We can feel warm fuzzies about it. And yet that is not what makes someone a genuine follower of Jesus. So what does it look like? Well, again, it looks like us bearing fruit by the power of the Holy Spirit. It looks like us working out our salvation, the author uh, Philippians says. Paul says, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it's God who works within us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's for this reason that Peter, when he's writing to the church in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says to make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election." For if you practice these qualities, if you engage in these things, you will never fall. It keeps coming up again. You will never fall. Now, that passage is important because it reminds us, hey, doing these things and engaging these things, working out your salvation, that's not what makes you called or elect. It's just a confirmation of what God has already done in your heart. Again, working out your salvation. And... Honestly, a good test of that is how we respond to warnings like these in Scripture. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, Scripture says. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, when you hear a passage like this in Hebrews, it's so startling, again, a bucket of cold ice water on our back, how we respond to that. Like, as we walk through this passage, if you find in yourself that desire, I want to cling to Christ. I want to know Him more. I want to walk in deeper waters in my faith. I want to move further up and further into Jesus and be among those who, by God's grace, persevere. That desire for the Lord, 
That doesn't come from you. That comes from the Holy Spirit inside you, giving you that longing, that urging, that desire for Christ. And if you feel that right now, if you get that urgency within your soul right now, it's a good indication. That's because you have that genuine, sincere faith that is stirring within you by the Holy Spirit. And if we, we, yet if we can walk through a passage like we just did in Hebrews 6, and you feel absolutely nothing, and your response is, eh, not for me, probably for somebody else. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest to be among you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Because God perseveres his saints through words and warnings like these to stir us up to follow him. So how are we to respond? We do exactly what the author of Hebrews has been calling us to do. Pay much closer attention, he says, to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Let's, let's work at our salvation in fear and trembling, knowing that the Holy Spirit is working in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this is a hard passage for us to hear. I confess, God, it's a hard passage for me to preach. There's a wrestling that, that you know I've been leaning into all week in this. But God, I, I don't want to be like that captain of a ship who sees the message and then ignores it. But Father, we, we put these words out there for us to hear and to us to receive and to take them seriously because they're, they're breathed out by your Spirit. Father, give us wisdom to, to by your grace, test our hearts, to test our lives, and, and to be able to to know whether or not we're simply surrounded by the things of Christ or if we are in Christ. If we know about Jesus or if we know Jesus. Well, there is a difference. Father, I pray for those today who needed to hear and be encouraged by the reminder that we heard earlier that for those who are in Christ, our salvation is secure, that no one and nothing can snatch us from your hand. That even when we have sin and struggle and, 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 and seasons of absolute just train wreck moments, nothing can snatch us away. We belong to you. And as we continue to come to you, your throne is always a throne of grace and mercy for those who come to Christ. You never will ever turn anyone away who genuinely seeks to know and follow you. But Father, I pray that you would also wake us up if there be among us any who are just surrounded by the things of Christ but haven't truly made that decision to follow him, to know him, to go all in on Christ and his kingdom over and above all things. <clears throat> Father, would your word stir us up today and do your work in us. In Jesus' name, amen.